All right. So Psalm 46, we're still going through another Psalm 10 pack. And today it's Psalm 46. And it's not that long, only 11 verses, but don't let that fool you. There's a lot in here. If we look at verse 1 there, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. But he's always ready to help you. You don't have to wait. Now, you might have to wait for the answer. You might have to wait for the actual help. But actually, the waiting can be part of the answer, right? So he's, he's a refuge. A refuge is, is like uh, somewhere, a safe place you can hide. If you think of a refugee, they're, they're going into a safe country to hide, right? To hide out from the trouble that was in their home country. And strength, right? God isn't just uh, a safe place. He's also our strength. And a very present help in trouble. It says, therefore, therefore is there because he is our refuge. He is our strength. He is always ready to help us. It says, therefore, will not we fear? Right? If we have God of the whole universe on our side, why would we be afraid? Right? I mean, there's nobody stronger than God. There's nobody that can even get close to, to God. And so, therefore, will we not fear? Though the earth be removed... Now, we haven't gotten to the point where it feels like the earth has been removed, but maybe we've gone sometimes into trouble and it feels like the earth is just falling down, the sky is falling down around us. But if you look at this psalm, even though it feels like that, we should not fear because God is our strength, God is our refuge, and He's a present help in trouble. Even if the earth was removed. And though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Just imagine that. The mountains going into the sea. Mountains going into the ocean, falling into the ocean. I mean, if you can imagine that, maybe you could have enough faith to say that mountain, you know, remove hence into the sea or something like that. I don't have that kind of faith. I wish uh, that my faith would increase. But when I pray for that, though, and this is not part of the sermon, but I sometimes pray that God would increase my faith, and then, but then I think of it and I say, but God, please have mercy on me because he can increase your faith by allowing bad things to happen to you and helping you through it. And then your faith will be better once you're on the other side. So if you pray for your faith to increase, that might be some tribulation along with it to help your faith increase, right? So though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, Though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. And if you would, please turn to Revelation 16. Revelation 16. So I think this is actually talking about a real event in history. I shouldn't say history. It'll future history in prophecy, actually. Okay. Uh, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled. Though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Just imagine an earthquake that shakes the mountains. Right? And remember, verse 2 talks about the mountains being carried into the midst of the sea. Mountains are pretty big. I don't know how many cubic feet. Probably when you, you probably measure them in acre feet or something. A cubic feet would be such a high number. In Revelation 16, let's look at verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. So I was just curious how bad of an earthquake there has been in recorded history. So I, I looked and I, I clicked on the one that says the eight most powerful earthquakes uh, ever recorded. Okay. And I think you're probably all familiar with the Richter scale, right? That's the magnitude of the earthquake, how bad it shakes. And I'm just going to take some highlights here. There's some pictures. You can come and look at this after. But actually, does anybody know where the worst recorded earthquake has ever been is in, as far as magnitude? Anybody? Any of the men? Where's that? Uh, not on the recording list. Do you know? I thought you raised your hands. Uh, it's actually Alaska. In March 28, 1964. And it got to 9.5 on the Richter scale. That's pretty high. Um, and the earthquake triggered a tsunami that affected most of the Pacific, causing fatalities in Hawaii, Japan, and the Philippines. You think, how far is Hawaii from... Uh, we've got one American here. How far is Hawaii from... I'm going to put you on the spot. Approximately. 
How many hours? I mean, you know, it's like, would it be halfway to Japan? Uh, yeah, something like that, right? It's far away, and, and not only that, it doesn't stop in Hawaii, the tsunami goes to Japan and the Philippines. In Chile, or Chile, right, South America, it killed 1,655 people, left more than 200,000 homeless. That's just from the tsunami from this earthquake. That's amazing. Nine and a half on the Richter scale. Second one, uh, December 26, 2004, Indonesia, 9.2. They call it the Good Friday earthquake. 131 people died, for, it lasted for four minutes. Uh, earthquake caused destruction of surrounding 130,000 square kilometers. It's quite a bit of damage. Uh, number three was 9.1 on the Richter scale, Japan, March 11, 2011. Uh, devastated 14 countries in Asia and Africa. Uh, an earthquake caused great destruction, ranking as high as 9 on the Mercalli intensity scale, and the ensuing tsunami caused more casualties than any other in history. So even though this is, what I said, fourth in, in magnitude, it actually caused more casualties than any other in history, though. Never mind what we don't haven't heard about. These are only really, there's some in 1900s, and then the rest are like, it's like we don't know much about them, but there's some before that that are, are like talked about or, or uh, written down in history, right? So what's the Mercalli scale? So you've got what's called the Richter scale. That's the magnitude, I guess, how big the waves are, right? But then Mercalli is actually uh, intensity scale, and it has to do with how much damage happens, okay? Um, so it's not like, it's more, I wouldn't say subjective because it is a little bit, but uh, it's kind of on what happens. Like, if, For instance, number one is not felt except by very few under spe especially favorable circumstances. Like most people like wouldn't even notice it or it's like, did something just happen? Okay, that's, that's a one on the Mercalli. I'll skip ahead uh, to number five on the Mercalli scale. Felt by nearly everyone, many awakened. Some dishes, windows, etc. Broken a few instances of cracked plaster, unstable objects overturned. Disturbance of trees, poles, and other tall objects sometimes notice pendulum clocks may stop. So that's number five. And that just keeps on going up from that. So there is actually kind of a loose, um, uh, of course I'm not thinking of the word right now, but uh, a, a loose connection to the Richter scale. So basically one to three on the Richter scale would be a one on the Mercalli scale, okay? Uh, three to 3.9 is two to three, 4 to 4.9 is 4 and 5, 5 to 5.9 is 6 and 7, and then 6 and six to 6.9 is 7 to 9, and then 7 and greater on the Richter scale is 8 and greater. So I'll just skip ahead to 8 and greater. So that's, because like ones that are above 7, those are like really, really serious ones usually, right? So 8, damage slightly, sorry, damage slight in specially designed structures. So these are like specially designed against earthquake, right? So there's damage, a little bit of damage in specially designed ones. Considerable damage, in other words, in ordinary substantial buildings with partial collapse, great and poor, poorly built structures. Panels, wall, panel walls thrown out of frame structures, fall of chimneys, factory stacks, columns, monuments, walls, heavy furniture overturned. So that's an eight. That's where the Richter scale starts at on seven. Um, skip ahead to 10. Some well-built wooden structures destroyed. Most masonry and frame structures destroyed with foundations. Ground badly cracked. Rails bent, like the, on the railroad. There's actually a picture here. I think the Anchorage one had like the railroad, the picture of the railroad bent. Um, landslides considerable from river banks and steep slopes. Shifted sand and mud. Water splashed over banks. 11, few if any masonry structures remain standing, bridges destroyed, broad fissures in ground. Fissures are the cracks in the ground, right? Underground pipelines completely out of service, earth slumps and landslips and soft ground, rails bent greatly, all right? Uh, and then 12, damage total, waves seen on ground surfaces. So you're seeing the earth wave, right? I don't know if this is a sine wave, I'm just assuming it's a sine wave. Um, lines of sight and level distorted. Objects thrown upward into the air. That's amazing. That's an earthquake, okay? 
And this is, that was the Mercalli earthquake intensity scale. So this earthquake in Japan was as high as nine on there. So it's not even until 12 yet, but it is, it had the tsunami caused more casualties than any other in history. And then you could keep going down. There was one in, uh, in, sorry, let me see. There was actually that same earthquake, uh, the damage totaled more than 309 billion US dollars. That was in 2011, okay? November 4th, 1952, Russia, it was a nine. Uh, no person was killed. Uh, I'm just gonna skip through this fast. February 27, 2010, Chile, that was an 8.8. .8. 500 people, more than 500 people. And they felt as high as uh, nine on the Mercalli intensity scale. Uh, the total economic loss in Chile alone was more than 30 billion US dollars. Another Alaska one, 8.7, this was in 1965. This earthquake ruptured a 600 kilometer segment of the Aleutian Islands, generated a tsunami around 35 feet high on a nearby island. So just from shaking the ground, there's a wall of water, 35, I mean, it's twice as high as this building, right? Actually, probably more like three times the size of this building, or at least, yeah, not quite three times the size of this building. A wave of water. If that kind of wave of water hit this building, it would just be nothing here, right? Um, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, actually, I missed number seven, which was January 31st in, in Ecuador. Um, anyway, I, I might have skipped some. Now, there's some that are listed that uh, were in history, right? There's one in 1868, approximately nine on the Richter scale and 11 on the Mercalli. Lisbon, Portugal, 1755. 8.7 and 10 on the Mercalli. So, and, and that one is from written records of, of the subsequent tsunami in Japan. So there's some pretty bad earthquakes. I'll just set, set these here so I have more room. <coughs> pretty bad. But you know what the, the Bible says here? What did, what did it say there in, in Revelation 16? It said in verse 18, and there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon earth. So way worse than has ever happened or that will happen till this point. Now there's been some really bad ones. 35 foot tsunami, like six, what did it say? 1,600 or 16,000 square kilometers, I think it was. Damage, right? There's been some huge earthquakes. I've never felt an earthquake. I don't know what it's like, right? People on the, on the west coast there, maybe, maybe they didn't know what it's like. I mean, the closest I've ever felt to an earthquake was when I worked uh, on Notre Dame Avenue in Winnipeg, and like a big semi would drive past, and our building was like right close to the road, and you'd feel the building shake a little bit, right? I'm assuming a mild earthquake would feel something like that. Um, but so mighty an earthquake, so great. So there's going to be coming a time when there's going to be a, a huge earthquake, and Revelation 16 uh, records it, and this is when the seventh angel pours out his vial. Now, I think the, the pouring out of the vials is, is, is concurrent with ladybug. It, not concurrent with the ladybug, but concurrent with the trumpets, okay? So there's, there's vials and there's trumpets, right? So at the, when the seventh angel pours out his vial, there's going to be lightnings, there's going to be thunders, it's going to be scary, right? But then there's going to be a great earthquake just going to shake. I mean... You would not have to go up that far in the Richter scale till this building here would fall down. And sometimes people will all just go run into the, you know, when I was in the fire department, oh, sorry, it's a tornado resistant building. That's, that's uh, deceptive. Maybe it's a tornado up to what, an F4 or F5, but God can always make a bigger tornado. God can always make a bigger earthquake, right? There's a building, and I don't remember where it is. Is it somewhere in Indonesia or somewhere that part of the world? They have like a, and there's maybe more places that have that. They have a, a counterweight pendulum inside their building that's supposed to help 
counteract the shaking, right? It was like, just think of a grandfather's clock. It's got like a pendulum and it's in the building. They try to make these things so that they will counter, counteract this. But they can't build things God-proof, right? They can't make things earthquake-proof. They can make it earthquake-resistant so a little one doesn't do it. But just like when God allowed big armies to fall with against little armies, you can do the same thing with earthquakes. There's some minor mistake or some little flaw in the material, right? Oh, they didn't quick get their concrete mix right or whatever, or just a miracle. You just have a little shake and then poof. Like fall in his footprints, sort of like, what was that? 9-11? When the building falls right into his, I don't know, yeah, that was an earthquake. We won't start that conspiracy. So anyway, there's a big earthquake here. And that kind of matches up with Psalm 46, where it talks about the mountains being carried into the midst of the sea. Just imagine an earthquake big enough for the mountain to fall into the sea. Right? And the mountains shaking with the swelling thereof, of the waters. Right? Well, when the end times come, by the way, we're out of here before the trumpet starts sounding and the vials start being poured out. We're out of here after the fifth seal is open, right? Actually, after the sixth seal, and then before the sixth seal gets carried out, we're, we're gone. But let's keep reading about this earthquake, though. It's very interesting. Verse 19. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And what does it say there in verse 20? And every island fled away. What did it say there? Like the Aleutian Islands were ruptured. I'm not quite sure what that means. There's like a great fissure or a crack in these islands. And Aleutian Islands, I think, are off the coast of Alaska. Right? And every, not just some, every island fled away. What does that mean? There's such a great earthquake. They're going below the sea level. Right? And it says, and the mountains were not found. It's like it shook so bad, the mountains fell down. What happened to them? Well, maybe they were carried out to the sea, like Psalm 46 says, right? And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Can you imagine? You're scared out of your wits with this big earthquake. And then there's a big hail falling. Every hailstone is a talent heavy. And talent, in my opinion, is about 30 pounds. 30 biblical pounds. I don't know. Pounds might have changed since then. I'm not going to go heavy detail. I'll just give you references. You can look it up later. You don't have to write down. You can just check the, the video later. But in, in uh, Exodus 38, verse 25, 26, it said it, you can find uh, the 3,000 shekels of silver in one talent. 3,000 shekels in one talent. In 2 Chronicles 9, verse 16, and 1 Kings 10, verse 17, you find out by comparing the two that 100 shekels of gold is in one pound. And so you, you, you can figure these things out. And so there's 3,000 in a shekel. You do the math, 3,000 divided by 100. So there's 30 pounds in one talent. Just imagine a hailstone that's 30 pounds. It would come right through the rafters. It would come probably through the floor here. Right? I mean, I don't know what point it, it, it reaches terminal velocity, but it'd be going really stinking fast. Right? And so, all this scary stuff happens, and these tough guys, what are they doing? They're so called tough guys, I would call them stupid guys. They're blaspheming the name of God. Why? They're not saved people, they hate God. They realize God is causing this, and they're yelling and blaspheming at God. Instead of crying out for mercy. Well, a lot of these people by now are probably reprobates, right? They've taken the number, uh, the mark of the beast in their right hand or in their forehead, right? So, and there was also, uh, sorry, it, it calls it a plague of the hill. So that, that's pretty bad. Bad earthquake. It says every island fl 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 flees away and the mountains were not found. That's some ground disturbance, right? I mean, can you understand why it's an earthquake such as never has been? Because there's an earthquake that, that happened, and I don't know if any mountains have ever fallen over because of an earthquake, right? 
in Revelation 11, this is, and, the, and this is one of the ways you can tell that the vials and the trumpets line up because this is also the seventh angel. Instead of the seventh angel of the vials, the seventh angel sounded the trumpet. Right? Revelation 11. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So this is right at the end of God pouring out his wrath. And so the seventh angel sounds a trumpet, right? And then, of course, four and twenty elders, they uh, worship the Lord and they give him thanks. And in verse 19, it says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Does that not match up with Revelation 16? I would say it matches up. Right? It's just another proof that you take Revelation 1 through 11 and start again at chapter 12. So the, these do match up. We have the exact same things. We have an earthquake that happens. We have the great hail. We have lightnings and voices and thunders. Now, this, is, this, this will be pretty interesting. And you know what? When you read in different places in the Bible... And how it's going to be after Jesus comes back and, and how even the, the landscape is different, right? And, you know, of course, there's you know, three and a half years of tribulation. We get raptured away. There's another approximately three and a half years. God pouring out his wrath on the, on the people that are here. Uh, of course, not on the two witnesses or the 144,000 that are sealed uh, by God. And then... After that, Jesus is going to come in a white horse, on a white horse, and he's going to set up his earthly kingdom, right? But then there's going to be a thousand years where he's going to rule and reign here, and there's still not all saved people. There's going to be us that are resurrected, and then there's going to be other people that made it through, and they're going to repopulate the earth, right? Now, the old IP want to tell you the next thing in God's prophetic calendar is Gog fighting with Magog, Right? And they go to like places like Ezekiel 38. And other than Ezekiel 38, and other than in Revelation, uh, Gog and Magog are only mentioned basically in genealogies. Okay, so these two two places, Ezekiel 38 and 39, match up with uh, Revelation. Okay, and the reason I want to bring this up is because it also mentions a severe event. Now. Obviously, this other one I just talked to you about, that is during the seven years. This other one here is at the end of the thousand years. So I think, again, there's going to be a change in the earth. In Ezekiel 38, starting in verse 18, it says, And it shall come to pass at the same time when God shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God. And, and just in case you're wondering... Um, Let me see here. I would later in my notes, but just so you uh, kind of get where I'm talking. It, it's Revelation 20 that, that matches up with, with this. Okay? When Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come out in my face. Sounds like God's mouth, right? For in my jealousy and the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. Sounds like an earthquake again. Right? I think it's unmistakably that Revelation 11 and 16, because of the vials and the trumpets, it's during the seven-year period. Right, It's the second half, of the, and it's towards the end, just before Jesus comes, sets up his kingdom. But this here is at the end. And we're going to see, uh, it, it, it's obvious when you compare to Revelation 20, that the devil comes out again after being locked up a thousand years, that it cannot be earlier. Okay? So, in verse 19, it says, For in my jealousy and the fire... Okay, so, so I think I read that already. There shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. Listen to how bad the shaking is. So that the fishes of the sea... Just imagine fishes of the sea. You think a, a pendulum 
in a building is supposed to dampen the effects of an earthquake. But now it's the fishes of the sea. They're in a, and they're in a fluid. You think there'd be some dampening there, right? So the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven, they're in midair, right? And the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men of that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The fish in the sea, they're shaking at his presence. That's how big of a shaking there will be. If that's going to happen, don't you think that's going to move some mountains, move some islands maybe, right? And the mountain shall be thrown down. I thought they were down in 11. Well, you know what? People want to say there wasn't a worldwide flood because you know how much water it would take to cover the mountains so that nobody could stand out of the water? Well, how big were the mountains then? I don't care if they're twice as big as what they're now. If God says that the whole world was flooded, it was flooded. Yeah. But maybe the landscape was different. Maybe the mountains were smaller. Because what happens when the fountains of the deep are broken up, right? You have some, maybe some plates that are fissured or cracked or whatever, and you might have them form mountain ranges after the flood, right? And so if in Revelation 11 and 16, the mountains are already knocked down because of all this water and whatever happens, you can have new mountain ranges formed. It has to be. Otherwise, how can you have mountains thrown down again? I don't think it's a case of, well, all the mountains are down, so now we're going to call the Hills Mountains like we do in Manitoba, right? Turtle Mountain and uh, what's the one by Dauphin? Riding Mountain. No, there's another one there too. What's that? Duck, Duck Mountain, yeah. So there's, we can, there's, I drove past Duck Mountain the other day by Dauphin. It's, it's, it's a hill, right? And Turtle Mountain. I remember hearing some uh, radio chatter over the company that I worked in there. They were just commenting the Turtle Mountain. It doesn't look like much of a mountain to me. Well, to a turtle, it's a mountain, he said. Right? So in Manitoba, we have a different standard of mountains. But no, it's not that. I think new mountains are formed. They're formed, but then they're flattened again, right? Because it says, the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. Even Trump's wall, not that that's such a big wall. Even the wall of China, right? Any wall, a wooden wall, concrete wall, stone wall, doesn't matter. They're all going to fall to the ground. I'm talking about the China wall. Uh, I don't know if... I haven't looked at China well, but I would have noticed in some pictures is that it looks like a farmer didn't do a good job having his fence post straight. It's like straight, but then all of a sudden there's a curve in there like that. He did it. He made it straight. What happened is the earth has, has shaken and now, or some other, you know, event that's happened. Now those fence posts went out of line, maybe partial landslide. It looked like it was a flat territory though. So it could have been an earthquake. It can move things around, can move the ground. And every single wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him through, remember this is at the end of the thousand years. Right? And I will call for a sword against him through it all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother and I will plead against him with pestilence, with blood and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Now you say, well, I think, I think maybe that's the same as Revelation 11 and 16. I mean, you can make the case. The problem is, but Gog and Magog, that lines up with Revelation 20. Revelation 20 specifically talks about, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but a rebellion by people, and Satan's leading that rebellion after Christ is reigning a thousand years, and after the devil's led out of hell. But in Isaiah, it, it also prophesies this. It says, every valley shall be exalted. So the valleys are going to be filled up. Exalted means to be lifted up, right? And every mountain and hill shall be made low. So not just mountains, hills too. No more duck mountain, no more turtle mountain. Flat, right? Everybody gets to be the prairies at that point in time, I guess, right? Uh, and the crooked shall be made straight, in the rough place is plain. I wonder what you mean, or what it means, crooked shall be made straight. Well, you throw something crooked into a fire, what happens? It straightens up. Or you put a straight 
grain, like a stick in, or in, in the, the, the fire, it, it, it curves, right? Water, uh, rivers that are, are, are crooked, could all of a sudden be made straight because of the excess flow and the current. It doesn't want, it's going so fast, it doesn't want to go around those curves. It's going to cut a new river, right? And so everything that's crooked will be made straight. And, every, and the rough places plain. Sounds like some erosion, some like rough places. Let's say where there's like boulders all over or like uh, maybe a, a, say a place where a volcano has gone before and there's these really rugged or rough terrain. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if that one fits. But there's going to be some geography or some terrain change in the world. Like just think of, of, of before the flood. Right? The Bible talks about this, um, this river, right? And it's got its four heads. Uh, it talks about the names of the, this river. And, and you know what? We have a Euphrates River now. But do you think that matches up exactly with what, how it was before the flood? Not necessarily. Give it the same names. Because I'm sure people have looked at this in, in Genesis and, oh, the land of Ophir where there was gold. And they try to figure out where there's all this gold, right? Not realizing, you know, 6,000 years, maybe somebody mined it out already. Not just that, the flood, right? Change your landmarks and change your geology probably. Even. So anyway, it says, every valley shall be exalted. And every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight. And the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now, the glory of the Lord will be revealed when he comes on a white horse. Some of the glory of the Lord will be revealed when, he, when the rapture happens. Right? Every eye will see him. Even those that pierced him will see him. Right? Um, but when he comes to white horse, his glory will be revealed because the sword of his mouth will defeat his enemies. Uh, after the thousand years, his glory will be revealed because again, he's defeating his enemies and all these things that happen, right? And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. That will give God great glory. <laughs> Just him flattening the mountains and filling up the valleys, making the islands smooth even. Now, this is quoted in Luke chapter 3. So Isaiah, what was that, 40, I think? Yeah, Isaiah 40, verse 4, is quoted in Luke 3. And starting in verse 4. As it is written, written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, this is talking about John the Baptist, right? Now, there might be some... Fulfillment of this just by the, the ministry of John the Baptist or the ministry of Jesus. But there's also a future a fulfillment of when it physically happens, right? Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be brought low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough way shall be made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. So not only are we going to see these great events happen, but everybody's going to see the salvation of God. Right? How? Well, think of at the end of the thousand years. How are, how are we going to see the salvation of God? Well, even in Revelation 19, when it comes with, her, with his white horse, how are we going to see the salvation? We get to sit on our horse and watch him wipe out the enemies. We don't even have to fight. We just see the salvation of the Lord. When this, these rebellious people form with Satan, Gog and Magog, they say, oh, we'll go to the unwalled cities. We're going to go defeat them, Right? And then God's just going to destroy him. And we'll see the salvation. He saved us from our enemies once again. Now obviously we'll see the salvation of God in the resurrection. Right? And if you would, turn to Revelation 22. Revelation 22. We'll See, I mean, in some ways we've seen the salvation of God as far as... I shouldn't say we've seen it. We have sort of seen it, but not like... We, we see it by faith though. Right? We're saved, but on the day of redemption, we'll actually see the salvation. Right? This is another time we're going to see the salvation of God. We're going to be taken away from the devil trying to destroy us on the earth, and we're going to be saved. And all flesh will see the salvation of God. Not everyone will have the salvation of God, but every eye will see it, though. Just imagine the great white throne of judgment. Everybody is going to see 
the salvation of God, but some people can be thrown back in hell if they're even taken out for that trial. I don't know, maybe it's just God's broadcasting into hell, right? Every eye uh, will, will see that. Just imagine though, right? Everybody see it. But if you're on the right side of it, it's going to be great. We're going to give glory to God. But guess what? Those that are on the wrong side of it, they're going to give glory to God too, but too late to reprobate, right? They're, and they're all going to be reprobate at that point. But let's get on to more pleasant subjects for a little while, shall we, beloved? Psalm 46, let's look at verse 4. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. The holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. So there's a river. And I got you to turn to Revelation 22. Let's look at this river here for a little bit. Revelation 22, 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now talk about good water, right? It's coming from the throne of God, right? The throne of the Lamb. That's going to be good water. I'm assuming we'll be able to drink from it. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life. Which, that's the one that we can't eat from right now, right? Which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face and his names, sorry, and his name shall be in their foreheads. There shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. You see, this is um, New Jerusalem, right? And on the earth, and um, God, Jesus' throne is going to be there, and there's going to be a river flowing from it, right? And so, when Psalm 46, verse 4 says, There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, I think it's referring to that river. Right? And we're going to like that river that comes from the throne of God. It'll be great. I don't know if we get to go fishing in there or not. Um, but we'll find out. Let's keep going though. Psalm 46, verse 5. So that, that it's a nice river, peaceful. God's going to have his kingdom set up. It's going to be great. Okay. It says in verse 5, God is in the midst of her. Or does not sound like what I just read in Revelation 22. She shall not be moved. She is in the, the city or the, or the river, right? Um, God shall help her and that right early. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. Now this is where I got the title of my sermon this evening. Yes, it's Psalm 46, but I also titled it, He uttered his voice, the earth melted. Just imagine the earth melting. I mean, how much heat does it take for dirt to melt or for stone to melt? It depends what kind of stone, right? The earth melted just by God saying it, just by Jesus saying it. No, I mean, God created the world by speaking it into existence, right? Through Jesus Christ. All things were created by him and for him. And so when he speaks, he can also melt it. Now, what does that mean? Are we going to, he's just going to melt the earth and we're not going to live here anymore? We're going to go to a different planet or something? We're gonna, it's going to get destroyed. We've got to, you know, take Elon's uh, SpaceX ship to Mars or to Kolob or something, right? Kolob is just a Mormon invention, right? But, um, no, okay. But uh, let's see what the Bible says about it, okay? I think most of you probably know what's going to happen. In 2 Peter 3... Starting verse 10, the Bible says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In the which, and the day of the Lord can be the exact day of the rapture, but it can also be the time period. Right? You call the whole three and a half years after he comes the day of the Lord. Right? But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The earthquake can make a big noise, right? And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Wow. There's going to be a lot of heat. The elements are going to melt. The earth also and the works that are in shall be burned up. Some people want to make a monument or they want to make a, a legacy for themselves. Somebody like Absalom made the pillars. That's going to be flattened. It's probably already flattened, right? Excuse me. But everything's going to be burned up, no matter what 
what gets me? Now, the same thing happens in our lives, okay? We have a window of opportunity where we can do good works. Now, the wood, hay, and stubble, they're just going to be burned up. But the gold, the silver, the precious stones, those are going to abide and we're going to get rewarded for those, right? It's kind of a, a neat picture here that all the works, it says the works that are therein shall be burned up. I don't care if you make it concrete. I don't care if you make it out of um, asbestos, right? Something we're still exporting from Quebec apparently. I don't care if you make it out of unobtainium. It's going to burn up. Because God is the one that's going to burn up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So does that mean the universe is going to burn up? It's not going to be burn up the way you think it's going to cease to exist. But everything is going to be changed, though. Okay, because it says the heavens are on fire. It says they should be dissolved. It says the element shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Does that mean we get a new galaxy or a new universe and a new earth? Kind of, because the Bible does say it is new. But does that mean it's like a totally separate one that we're all going to move to Pluto or Jupiter or something? No, that's not what it means. Because if the heavens are burned up, those things would be burned up. If, if it was actually burnt up as in it just disappears or vaporizes, okay? But they're all going to suffer some damage. They're all going to get scorched. Just imagine if the whole earth was scorched. That'd be amazing. In Luke 17, sorry, verse 29, it says, But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven. And destroyed them all. So that's like a, a picture or a foreshadowing. Of what's going to happen when we leave? Right? The same day Lot left, fire and brimstone. Same day we leave, bad things start to happen. It says, even thus shall be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So the same day Lot leaves, fire and brimstone destroys all, all Sodom, right? Same day we leave, that's the same how it's going to be. Even, and you. Sorry, even thou shalt be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So there's going to be fire. There's going to be fervent heat. Now in Revelation 8, um, this is when the angels begin to prepare to sound. Okay? In verse 6, it says, And the seven angels which have the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. So we get some fire, right? Things are going to start getting heated up. I believe in global warming too. I just don't believe in the one that they're using to try to control people in the world. Hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth. And a third part of, tree, of trees was burned up. And all green grass was burned up. When it says the third part of the trees, it means every single tree on, in the world, one third of them are burned up. And not just that, all grass if you're, if you're a rancher or a cattleman, you have concern with that, right? But if you're a cattleman or a rancher, at that point in time, you've got bigger fish to fry, okay? Because the world is going to get hot. So, and the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast in the sea. The third part of the sea became blood. They usually, like, as, a, as if it was a big mountain, this big rock, or meteorite, or meteor... Sorry. The ones that hit the ground, are they meteorites or meteors, or what are they? Does anybody know? Nobody? Something like that, right? It's, it's The falling star often burns up before it hits the ground. Now, if there's a chunk that hits the ground, maybe even this side, it'll, it'll make a crater, right? But here, luckily, it hits the sea, so it, it absorbs some of the impact. But the sea turns to blood. This is... As it were, a great mountain burning with fire. Some, because when something enters our atmosphere and it comes into the, uh, and it falls so fast, it's going to get hot and it's going to get on fire, right? It's going to glow. And the third angel sounded, <coughs> excuse me, 
And there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of water. Waters And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. Many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. So when Psalm 46 uh, talks about um, that, that, that he's going to utter his voice and the earth melted. See, when God starts pouring out his wrath on the people here, he just has to speak it, and it happens, right? So, you know, he tells the angels to sound the trumpets, or he tells them to pour out his vials, and these things just start happening. Fire, right? Hail, all these different things. But the question is, does the earth get destroyed when we move on to a different planet? No, we're still going to be here. In Revelation 20, let's look at Revelation 20. And let's just talk about what we're talking about, Gog and Magog first, though. Um, <laughs> Just to, so you can see that it does line up with uh, Ezekiel 38. It says, When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So these are the thousand years of Christ's millennial reign, which are after the seven-year period that the old IFP calls the tribulation. And we call first three and a half years tribulation and the last three and a half the wrath of God. So Satan's going to be loosed. And it says, And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. So they're even surrounding or trying to surround heavenly Jerusalem. And this is what happens. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. God can just speak. He can just utter his voice and the elements melt. The earth melts. That's what can happen. And the, the, it will happen. God said it would happen and it will happen. Okay, so this question though, I mean, flip ahead to Revelation 21. Are we going to stay on this earth? Well, no, we're going to be taken away, but then we'll be returned. Okay, verse one. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. So wait a minute, I thought you said that we're still going to be back on this earth. Yeah, but it's going to be new. It's going to be a new earth. Just like the earth was a new earth after the flood, it was still the same earth. I'm going to prove it to you here in a minute, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that we're going to still be on this earth, or we're going to come back to this earth, but it's going to be made new. And the heaven is going to be made new. How is it going to be made new? I don't know. Maybe we'll even have different amount of gravity here. Uh, I mean, gravity might not affect us the same anyway in our glorified body, right? But anyway, there's going to be a new heaven and new earth where the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. So this is interesting, right? No more ocean. When it says no more sea, I think there'll still be lakes and rivers, but no more ocean. That means we're going to have four times as much living space as we do now. We're going to have a lot of, even if you had to explore all the land that's available right now, there's going to be another three parts of the earth that you haven't explored. No more sea. That's going to be really interesting. And so... If you think about it, there's enough room that everybody could have gone into eternity if everyone would have believed in Jesus Christ. God, God makes provision for everybody. Just like Christ died for all sins, not just those that got saved, not just the elect. God makes a provision for everybody. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And that's what we read in uh, verse 5 there in, in Psalm 46. God is in the midst of her, right? So the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. It's going to not just be a brand new earth, a brand new heaven. It's going to be a brand new lifestyle where there's no more sadness or sorrow, nothing to disappoint you. It's just going to be happy time all the time. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. He said, I make all things new. He didn't say, I will replace it. I make all things new. And he said unto me, right, for these words are true and faithful. After the flood, 
Noah built an altar unto the Lord and made a sacrifice. And God swelled, smelled the sweet savor. And he said, uh, Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. He says, While the earth remain, the seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So we're always going to have seed time. We're always going to have harvest. We have cold and we're going to have heat. Oh, wait a minute. I guess we were going to have cold. It's not just all going to be like Florida weather the whole earth. <laughs> but uh, I don't think it's going to feel cold to us, right? And summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. It always. But you see, but the first part there said, while the earth remaineth. Okay, so the, the question remains. Does the earth remain? Because if it does remain, we will always have seed time. We always will every year have harvest of cold, heat, summer, winter, day and night. Right? It says that. Well, Ecclesiastes 1 verse 4 is so clear that the earth will always be here. <coughs> we're not going to have to worry about global warming. We're not going to have to worry about a comet or a meteor hitting here. And we're going to spin in a controller or whatever and fall into the sun. Or a black hole or whatever you space fantasy you want to think of. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 4 says, One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh. <coughs> right? I'm not always going to be here in, in this body. I mean, <coughs> unless the rapture happens before I die, right? Uh, and then I'll get a new body anyway. But normally, throughout history, one generation passes. I mean, we're not still in the generation of Adam or the generation of, of Cain and Abel, right? We're many generations later. So one generation passeth away, and, and another generation cometh. But the earth abideth forever. Forever. Just like we have everlasting life, the earth will abide forever. Abide means to stay. It's crystal clear. It's always going to be here, but God is going to change it. Just like he changed the surface of it during the flood, in the end times, he's going to change it. Right? All the mountains are going to be made low. The islands are going to flee. I mean, and then... Somehow mountains happen again, and then at the end of the thousand years, they're going to be brought low again. Right? And they're going to be brought low, but does that mean in eternity we're never going to have mountains? Well, I think we will, because doesn't it say that, that God's going to place New Jerusalem on a hill? Right? It's going to, unless that's part of the city thing that comes down, but it's going to be Mount Zion, Right? So, but the earth is going to abide forever, but the, the face of it changes. So God will make all things new. He'll make the heavens new, right? That's the heavens. I think it said plural, right? Let me just double check, back up a little bit. Behold, I make all things new. Um, no, in verse 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I'm not sure if that's where it's looking. So a new heaven and a new earth. So at least... A, because if it was heavens, it would be the it would be the atmosphere, and it would be like um, the the planets and the the space around there, right? So anyway, let's finish this chapter off. We're almost done here. Um, Psalm four. So we can see the Earth is always going to be here, but it's going to change. And there's some big change. Like this is prophecy way back when, right? Um, the chief musician for the sons of Korah, a song upon Alamo. So I don't know how far back, but it was back in the Old Testament, right? And this is prophecy about some ground-shaking truths, so you could say that, right? I mean, earth-shattering news. Mm -hmm. The earth abides forever, though. So it says in verse 7, the Lord of hosts is with us. Yeah, because he's going to live with us at that point. But he's also with us if, if we're saved and we're doing his will. The God of Jacob is a refuge, Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord what desolations he hath made in the earth. And you think there's rubberneckers when we have an accident scene. Just imagine how much we'll want to like, oh, wow, look at what God did. He really flattened that Mount Everest, right? And the Rocky Mountains are no longer there. Trudeau can't name it after his dad, right? He already has a mountain named after him. It's called the National Debt. Anyway, enough about <laughs> politics. Right? And it's going to be gone, but we're going to see the damage. Come behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. And this, I like this part. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow, sorry, the bow, and cutteth the spear in the sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. So there's going to be a come a time when the weapons are going to be burned up because we're going to, not going to need weapons anymore. He makes wars to cease. In Isaiah 2, it says, 
in verse 2, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established. This is what we're talking about, right? Heavenly Jerusalem, the mountain. Um, in the top of the mountains, it shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow onto it. Many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. We will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. Who are you going to learn hand-to-hand combat? As cool as you may think that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or Muay Thai or whatever your thing is, is how cool it is, we're not even going to learn anymore because what, why would we learn something that's going to be useless to us, right? I mean, how many people nowadays are learning how to build fax machines or, or telegraphs or anything like that? Because it's outdated. We don't use that anymore, right? And so if war, we realize we're never going to have to be in a war anymore, why would we learn this? Why would we learn, you know, strategic uh, strategies and, and tactics, right? We're not going to read the book, The Art of War by the, the Sun Tzu. Chuck, who is it? Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu, yeah. And we're not going to learn that, right? And that's, anyway, I don't want to get off of that tangent. It's going to be useless information. So we're not going to learn anymore. That's going to be great. And then the last um, two verses. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. So God will be exalted one way or the other. And it's the way that he says it will happen. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is a refuge. Selah. So God will be exalted among the heathen. He'll be exalted in the earth. He's going to be exalted. In Isaiah 45, it says, Look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say, and the Lord have a righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. And the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. We're going to be glorying in the Lord. He's going to be exalted. And wow, we got some things to look forward to. But for the, some people, it's not going to be so cool as for us, right? But it's going to be great having Jesus living with us. I mean, that, just think of that, right? Having meals with Jesus, having fellowship with Jesus, and, and with all these saved saints from all the years. It's going to be great, but man, it, this earth is going to change. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your word. And thank you for your power, and we can see how mighty... It is, and we don't even know the half of it, Lord God. It's going to be very humbling to see it in person the, the destruction that you have done after we come and look upon it. Please uh, help us to live like we've got a short time here, God. Help us to, to work because we know the night is coming. And uh, help us to, to not grow discouraged, but realize, man, you win and, and, and how great an end it is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.